issue led by the state of California, which has completed an extensive study and put forth recommendations to enact reparations. California's reparations actions have huge nationwide implications. The California Task Force was the first of its kind in the nation, and the states of New York and Colorado recently voted to take on the issue. Dozens of cities from coast to coast, including San Francisco, Boston, Los Angeles, and Detroit, have started their own reparations commissions. One of the first known reparationists was Callie House, who toured the nation advocating for reparations in the 1890s. But never in this nation's history has the movement to heal the harms of enslavement, institutionalized racism, and the system of white supremacy seemed so strong. The topic remains untouchable for most elected officials, and the call for reparations has not yet garnered widespread public support. Polling shows that most Californians agree that black fellow citizens are still suffering from the damage done by slavery and Jim Crow, but they still do not support cash reparations. The California Legislative Black Caucus has introduced a package of proposals for bills that do not include one penny of cash compensation, restitution, or repair. Governor Newsom and other lawmakers have distanced themselves from the concept of cash payments. While Newsom is right, cash alone will not repair our collective harm, the state's goofy legislative package ignoring monetary payments is disingenuous. California lawmakers need to step up and put a reparations bill for cash payments on the table. The issue of how it is funded, the timeline, or whether it impacts our current budget challenges can be addressed. But we must strike while the iron is hot or the window of opportunity will pass us by. If you agree that it's time for our lawmakers to add a bill enacting cash payments to their lineup, call them at 916-319-3868 and say, if it doesn't include cash, it ain't reparations. That's 916-319-3868. Tell them Cali House sent you. From Bruce's Beach to the California Task Force, the Golden State is a trailblazer when it comes to reparations. The world is watching. We must rise to the historical moment and set a precedent for cash payments along with legislative remedies and policies addressing the systemic badges of slavery and Jim Crow. We must insist on measures significant enough to help close the racial wealth gap. California must stand for cash, and the time for reparations is now. For KBLA Talk 1580, I'm Dominique DePrima. We welcome your comments. Free Big was much bigger than just a party. It was fashion, it was culture, it was food, it was music. And it was just black, 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 black everywhere. Black love, black excellence, black enterprise. Freaknik was the greatest black gathering in America. They didn't know to bring order to it because it was kids. Any revolution ever in the history of the world, when it's youth, they're not even speaking the same language. So how can you understand the value? This is when we begin to see this is not going to last forever. I'm Tavis Smiley. Uh, you just heard sounds from a new documentary on Hulu called Freaknik, The Wildest Party Never Told. The director of that project is P. Frank Williams, who I'm honored to have on this program. Brother Williams, how are you today, sir? Mr. Tavis Smiley, the legend himself. How are you, sir? Man, if I complained, I'd be an ingrate. I am doing remarkably well, <laughs> and I'm delighted to hear your voice and have you on this program. I am also thrilled to be reunited. It's been a lot of years. When I was on BET, that's how long I've known this next guy, since my BET days. And uh, he came on the show a number of times then. I was in Florida a number of times. We actually hung out in Florida uh, on a golf course and beyond. Uh, he loves to hit, he loves to, to, to hit the course. And it's been a long time since I've been in dialogue with the executive producer of this project, Freak Nick, the wildest party never told, Luther, Uncle Luke Campbell. Luke, how you living, man? Hey, man, I'm doing great, man. How about yourself, man? Yeah. Long time no see, no hear. Yeah. Wait, my man, my brother. <laughs> no, it has been a long time, and I'm glad to uh, glad to be connected and glad to have an hour to talk about this project. Let, let, let me just start with this. Um, Luke, why, why did you think, what is it about Freak Nick that warranted it being given documentary treatment? Man, let me tell you, uh, Tavis, uh, it's a part of my life. It's a part of my life story. You know, I had a deal with Lionsgate, and then I looked at the script, and I said, the script, it ain't covering everything. And so, you know, I sat down with uh, my good friends at Swirl, who I got a, a, a 
Rose and me, Nikki, and Jake. I want to tell my last story, and Freak Nick was one of them. You know, uh, Nikki, Nikki said, hey, look, let's do Freak Nick. Not knowing. Let me let me let Miles work on uh, on uh, Luke's phone while he's doing that. Frank, let me come to you, and I'm glad to have you on the program. As I said a moment ago, when, when when you're approaching, let me start with this: when you're approaching a project like Freaknik, uh, and again, I have no idea where one begins. But as a director, where, where do you where do you begin on a project like this when you're trying to give it a documentary treatment? Well, I mean, I think for me, I always uh, start with being able to tell the full story. What is where am I trying to go? You know what I mean? And I think as a person who as a young black man in the early 90s attended Freaknik. I'm a member of Alpha Phi Alpha, and so that was our time. We wanted to go out there and get turned up, you know, see the girls party. But as I got into it as a director and a producer, I realized that there was a lot more layers to it, way more nuanced story about race and class and culture and politics and the Olympics and sexual liberation and a lot of other stuff. So that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, first of all, I, I didn't know that Alphas turn up. I mean, I'm a cap. I know we turn up. I didn't know Alphas turn up. <laughs> You tell you tell okay, you, you, yeah, tell, you, yeah, tell, we, you tell you tell me Dr. King and Thurgood Marshall turn up. Well, you know there's there's different kind of alphas. You know what I mean? So sure we, we got it right. And, you know, I love my, my brothers, my, my second my, my my little brothers, the new stuff. So much love to y'all. Oh, I appreciate that. I appreciate. It. I I hear you. I hear you. Uh, let me. I I ain't gonna go there today. Uh, let, let let me let me ask you. Uh, when you when you went as a young man, as a student yourself, you went. Um. Tell me why, why, I'm not naive in asking this question, but why did you go? And I asked that question for this a reason, Frank. My, my board op is a, is a 27, 28-year-old young man named Miles. And Miles asked me, calls me coach. He said, coach, did you go to Freak Nick? And I said, actually, I didn't. He said, why not? I said, uh, I think it was a little too wild for me. I mean, I got, my, I, got my, I got my issues. I got my side, my wild side. But Freak Nick just wasn't calling my name. So I ask you why it called your name. Why did you go to Freak Nick? Well, I think that the most important part I think people forget is that this was like all these beautiful black people in one place having a good time. So beyond like the girls and the partying and the street stuff, it was like beautiful concerts, people hanging out in the park, communicating. And as a person who went to two white universities, Columbia and San Diego State, mm -hmm. I was just amazed to see these amount of beautiful black people. I had never seen that many in my life, having a good time, being peaceful enjoying each other. So I went for the joy and the fun, not just for the turn up. The, um, you, when you went, you were a student at which, which of those institutions? At San Diego State. San Diego State, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you, you traveled all across the country for Freak Nick then? Hey, man, you know, you got to go where the, where, the, where the candy is at, Mr. Chavis. <laughs> there was a lot of candy. Yeah, you know what I mean by the candy. So there was a lot of it everywhere. No, I, I understand. When you, when you, suggested earlier and i think you're right about this i want to just take some time to explore this um there there, there are layers there are textures to this freaknik situation there's race there's class there's culture um sexual identity there's there are all these issues again that one uh, uh, one gets to wrestle with when one sees the documentary as i have there's a lot to wrestle with here um but before i get to those those layers what's your sense of the way that writ large Freak Nick got labeled. Now, I think you take my point, the way it got labeled. Well, I know I think that, you know, as I put in the film, because it has the word freak in it, Freak Nick, I think that people thought of this, this was this sort of lewd, raunchy street parade where it was sort of no host bars and people were just doing crazy things. But as I point out in the film, Freak Nick just became from the actual dance, from Chic, La Freak. By the time these young people were in school at the AUC Center, Freak was a dance and a thing. So they merged one of the cultural things of their time in the late 70s, early 80s with Picnic. And so it, Freak Nick itself did not come from an actual yeah. lewd or crazy situation. It came from sort of an innocent place with a lot of young people enjoying themselves and having a good time. Yeah. So I think the misnomer about the name has generated a sense of, wow, that was a lewd party, when in fact yeah. it actually came from some of this sort of innocence of young black college students. We'll talk more about the name and what actually happened at Freak Nick and why it is now the subject of a documentary called Freak Nick, The Wildest Party Never Told, directed by P. Frank Williams and executive produced by Uncle Luke, uh, Luther Campbell. More when we come forward on Tavis Smiley. You're listening to Tavis Smiley. Tavis, Tavis Smiley. Rank number 45 on the heavy hundred list of the 100 most important radio talk show hosts in America. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, y'all. 
Mona Swain here from Target's new YouTube series, My Card is Full, where we feature black founders and creators highlighting their connection to our community. As an actor and content creator, I love using my voice to inspire young black women who look like me. When it comes to feeding my shine, seeing myself reflected in black owned and founded products at Target brings me joy. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. Learn more at Target.com slash Black Beyond Measure. Cookie wants to be a professional wrestler. I'm Cookie Serratos and I'm 11 years old. She also wants to win all the medals. That's why Cookie and her family make every day count, squeezing out her best with Go Go Squeeze. Okay, Cookie, let's break for a Go Go Squeeze. Go Go Squeeze fruit on the go pouches are a nutritious snack made from 100% fruit with no sugar added. Go Cookie! Because when you nurture your kids, you squeeze out the best in them. Squeeze out the best with Go Go Squeeze. Not a low calorie food. Products range from 11 to 13 grams of sugar and 60 to 70 calories per serving. There are many healthcare organizations serving our community. Not all are dedicated to community partnerships that educate, build trust, inspire hope, and improve outcomes. Providence has a robust community outreach program and has dedicated $50 million over the next five years to support organizations addressing health disparities in local communities of color. Examples of this commitment include the Biddy Mason Community Wellness Center on the first AME campus, providing medical screenings, mental health therapy, nutrition, and culturally sensitive holistic classes. The Black Mama's Glowing Peer Support Group that focuses on maternal mental health, birth planning, and social support. Providence is committed to building trusted partnerships with community organizations to better understand and dismantle structural, racial, and cultural barriers to better health. During Minority Health Month, Providence is sponsoring Health for a Better World. Informative conversations with Providence health professionals on Urban Family Focus every Saturday in April at 7 a.m. To find a Providence Health System facility near you, log on to Providence.org. Hi, this is Scott Trout of Cordell & Cordell. If you're a dad who is facing divorce, there are extra layers of stress that may include stereotypes and assumptions. No two situations are the same. Our legal experience and dedication prepare us for whatever legal challenges we face together. You need a partner you can count on. For more than 30 years, Cordell & Cordell has represented men in divorce. 1455 Frazee Road, Suite 1050, San Diego, California, 92108. Online at CordellCordell.com. Pizza's here. Oh, great. I'd love some, but I'm worried about my stomach issues. If you're worried about having diarrhea, gas, bloating, stomach pain, or loose oily stools, it may not just be stomach issues. It could be a condition called exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, or EPI. With EPI, the pancreas doesn't release enough enzymes to break down food, but EPI is manageable. Use the symptom checker on identifyepi.com and talk to your doctor. That's identifyepi.com. Sponsored by AbbVie. More honesty than you can handle. More empowerment than you can imagine. You're tuned in to Tavis Smiley. Smiley. Them kids ain't know nothing about freaking me. This wasn't an adult-sanctioned event. This is something that was driven by the youth. People are coming from far to experience Freaknik, purely by word of mouth. There was no social media, barely had internet. If you were a true baller, you would have the big camcorder and put it on your shoulder. People was outside their cars, people was on top of their cars. There wasn't even a word called twerking, it was called booty shaking. The streets, the people, the girls, the debauchery. <laughs> I don't know what heaven looks like, but this seems like a version of it. One of my favorite words, debauchery. <laughs> I'm like, I love, I love Frank, uh, the way they did this documentary, and somehow they weaved in the word debauchery uh, in a documentary about Freak Nick. By the way, I'm Tavis Smiley. I'm glad to have you hanging out with us in this hour. We are talking about the new Hulu documentary. It's called Freak Nick, The Wildest Party Never Told. Uh, the director of that documentary is P. Frank Williams, who I'm honored to have as a guest on this program right now. The executive producer is Luther, Uncle Luke Campbell, whose phone line dropped. Uh, I don't know if his phone dropped. We try to get him back on the line, but uh, Frank and I are going to keep rocking this thing for the rest of the hour, talking about this documentary that he directed, and we'll bring Uncle Luke in when we get him back on the line. Uh, but we were talking a moment ago, Frank, I want to come back to this conversation about this name, Freak Nick, and the way this thing got labeled. What was the downside? We're, we're going we're to work our way into this, but is there a downside 
to that, was there a downside to that name? Was there a downside to the name then labeling this thing a certain way in the minds of many people? That it was nothing but debauchery. No, I mean, I think I said earlier, it was a misnomer. And I think that because of it coming from that innocent place about these young black students at the AUC, and then sort of taking on a, 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 a name of its own and sort of a world of its own. And I do think later in the, you know, mid to late 90s, when it got a lot of out of control and as a as a trailer that we did says a little bit more debauchery yeah going on it, <laughs> there was a misinterpretation but it, again it started off in an innocent way yeah and i think through public consumption and some of the actions of the people who were partying it got to be known as sort of this wild escapades of a no host bar but that was not how it started yep so let me let me let me get more 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 basic more fundamental and we'll and we'll keep building this uh building this architecture of, of a conversation here um how did and why and what does it mean that this all happened in the ATL? Well, I mean, I don't, I don't think I've been telling people everywhere. I don't think that Freaknik could have happened in anywhere. Atlanta with the AUC, with the number of African-American, you know, black colleges. Mm-hmm. And I think that the political structure, the blackness of Atlanta, the time in which it happened. And I think that the proliferation of that amount of young black college students in the area gave rise to them creating their own festivals and making their own way. You know, Daytona Beach, you know, different kind of parties. Galveston Mm -hmm. may not have always had African-American components. So these kids, they basically couldn't afford to go home for spring break. And so they were able to start this basically as a small picnic that grew from 50 people to, hey, then there's 1,000, then there's 7,000, and 20,000, then there was 300. So, again, it started in a very organic way. Mm -hmm. I don't think the, the blackness of Atlanta, this couldn't happen in Cincinnati or, mm-hmm. you know, even Miami. It had to be Atlanta, a city that, you know, from top to bottom, especially at that point, was very black. Yep. We we heard in the clip, and by the way, I think we got Luke back. I'll put him in here in just a second here. Um, uh, we heard in that clip we just played um, that there was no there was there was no social media then. Um, this thing became um, the iconic uh, gathering that it became. Uh, strictly and simply by word of mouth. Now, let's just pause for a second. Word of mouth has always been the thing in, in our community. There's no, there's no question about that. Um, if you want a great reputation or a not so great reputation, <laughs> you know, be concerned about what people are saying about you as we talk to each other. So word of mouth has always been the communication mode of choice, I think, in our community. But when you think about what Freak Nick became, for those of us who were around back then, um, it is quite amazing in retrospect, Frank, that they pulled this off. This thing grew and grew and grew every year. And there was no social media. No, nobody was tweeting about this back then, Frank. No, I mean, like I said, this is just shows you how beautiful black people are. You know, there's a thing called a flyer. Tavis, have you ever heard of a flyer? Oh, yeah. And you would pass a flyer around and you'd give it to some <laughs> friends and you would hold on to that flyer for that party. There was no way to log on online to find out if there was no bent bright. None of that. Yeah. That was like your homie Tyrone told you your other new brother was like, yo, there's a party down in Atlanta on Thursday. It's like, all right, let's get in our Toyota Camry or our Maxima or whatever we were doing <laughs> back then, driving it with the, the, the Dayton Rams. Like, let's head down to Atlanta. And so I think that that just shows the power and the beauty of black people. It's almost like, I know this is a wrong railroad, right? How do you can carry a message from people to people, state to state, without any sort of real currency or, tra- you know, transmission. So yeah. I think that that's beautiful. Black people, we always create amazing things and do that word of mouth. Yeah. What, I want to bring Luke in here in just two seconds here. What, what, one quick question that's on my mind. We were talking a moment ago, Frank, about the fact, your point was that this couldn't have happened, Freaknik, that is, couldn't have happened anywhere but Atlanta, given the blackness of it, all those HBCUs, those schools there. I get it, that Atlanta is this place, uh, this birthplace of Freaknik, and it couldn't have been. Uh, it could have been birthed anyplace else. I take that point. How did the city of Atlanta... The, the 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 power base the 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 politicos how did they process all of these negroes coming to atlanta during this time of the year annually well you know one of the things you know, as much as i kind of knew some stuff about freaknik one of the things that i found fascinating and that i learned throughout this process of directing and producing this film i know that luke can speak on this because he's dealing with this now with the city of miami and young african-american students and all of that is that Bill Campbell, who was the mayor of Atlanta at that particular time, sure. did indeed try to embrace this event and figure out how to like monetize it and also make it a peaceful thing. So he relabeled it the Black College Spring Break Weekend. But one of the troubles that he had was, you're the mayor of this black city with all these beautiful young black people and everything, but you're also the mayor of the whole city. And a lot of white businesses was not happy with you mm-hmm. and your cousins and all your friends 
trashing the city for the whole weekend, doing stuff, partying in the streets. So he was faced as the mayor of the city to try to figure out how to make sure he appeases his African-American contingent, but also he's the mayor of the business part, which is black and white. And so it was a really stressful thing, I think, for Mr. Campbell at that time when he was the mayor, because he was trying to figure it out. A lot of people say he abandoned abandoned the black community and the African-American students when he sort of outlawed free kick in 1998, because mm-hmm. at the end of the when it got to be gropey and just rapey and people just doing really bad things around 97, 98, Bill Campbell did indeed come out and say that the city is not welcoming the event and also sent letters to other black colleges telling them not to send their students there. So it was a, it was a, t- a tough situation. If you're the mayor of a black city, you mm-hmm. want to help your black people, but you also got to please the businessman. We'll so talk, it's a tough situation. Yeah, we'll talk when we come forward about how this thing was birthed out of this ingenuity of these black students, as you put it, who couldn't afford to go home and word of mouth starts to spread. And they turned this thing into their own festival called Freaknik. It's pretty amazing how it began. And that's what black people do. That's why we had, we, 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 our whole, our whole existence is about taking nothing and turning it into something. So it's an amazing story of how it began, but then it descends. And we'll talk about why that descent started to happen, how it got so ugly and so nasty at the end, and why it got canceled in 1998 and the city is not welcoming it to Atlanta. Before I get to that part of the conversation, you know, uh, we got Luke back on the phone. Now, Uncle Luke is back. So, Luke, tell me, you start. You were starting to tell me before we lost your line, you started to tell me about the connection, uh, the direct connection between your career and Freak Nick. Make that connection for me, sir. Luke, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We've got him back, and now I can. Hey, Luke, see if you hit the mute button on your phone. Maybe your face or your ear. Your you hit the mute button, Luke. Can you hear me? Just check and see. Luke. All right. Um, <laughs> this is this is uh, this is not a bad day for technology. Uh, uh, Luke, uh, yeah, yeah. Luke, Luke has been all over the place too. By the way, you got to give Luke a break. He's been on every TV show and doing his thing. So I got to give my big brother a break there. No, I love but, him. No, he, he, yeah, Luke. Luke himself obviously talks about. You know, and I know, obviously, I've been doing interviews with him, and sure. I obviously interviewed him for the film, and I can't speak for him, but I can definitely say that, you know, for Luke, he, when he first went to Freak, he had been hearing about it, and this is what he told me in his interview, and he was like, what is this little sort of sweet, innocent picnic in the park? And he was like, when he got there, he brought the Freak to Freak Nick. So, you know, you went from the little D9 people in the park having their little drinks, trying to get numbers, and people hanging on the blankets, to here's Luke with the Work It Out video mm-hmm. in 1993 which I think turned Freaknik into a little bit more of a wilder party. And as Luke said in the film, he put the freak in Freaknik. Yeah, we tried to get his phone up, line up again, and so we had him on and lost him again. So that, that may not happen this hour. I apologize. But we we heard okay. his voice early uh, and yeah. uh, just couldn't, couldn't, couldn't sustain it. So let me, let me come back to this issue of, um, <clears throat> of the city of Atlanta uh, and how this thing eventually descended to a point where the mayor uh, disinvited people to come to Atlanta. Uh, can, in the documentary, do you do you do you discover where, when, how the descent started to happen? Yeah, I mean, I think as as I mentioned, it's probably around that mid '90s when things get a little bit too hectic. I think two of the main contributors to Freaknik ending. Number one was the traffic situation where there was way too many people yeah. taking over the city, clogging the streets. People couldn't get into businesses. Women who were pregnant couldn't get to the hospital. People couldn't get to weddings. It was out of control. People couldn't get to businesses. It was like four hours on the highway. People were having parties on the highway. Literally, mm. imagine right now, people just stop the 405 or the 110 and just having, a, you know, 100 cars out there turning up. So I think that was the main number one thing that happened. And number two, I think an element, you know, we can admit that sometimes the wrong element comes into these things. Young yeah. men and women, you know, people come out and they're not meant there to have a good time. They're meant to, you know doing inappropriate things with the women, harassment, some violence, that like stuff like that. So those are two key demises to the end of Freak Nick. Yeah. Um, and yet the flip side of that is I have to believe when you got that many people of any race, color or creed going into one particular locale, there has to be a bump to the local economy. So what did Freak Nick do for the economy of Atlanta? Oh, it was amazing. I mean, I think that people don't want to, you know, as Killer Mike says, in the piece, there was a turning of the black dollar. It wasn't as mm-hmm. traditional whatever but you got brothers and sisters at the restaurants they in the clubs they buying clothes you know it's been sort of said that 20 million dollars you know sort of you know for those few first few years and definitely in the mid 90s was made from freak Nick. you know but the ironic thing is that when the olympics came that was one of the things where i think the city was like we can't be on this public stage at the olympics the greatest moment in the history of atlanta 
and have all these kind of people wilding out in the streets and world seeing that. So the Olympics may, as I said, in the film may have made $20 billion and Freaknik made 20, I'm sorry, $2 billion mm -hmm. and Freaknik made 20. So that's a big difference. If you're Bill Campbell, that's a business decision that you have to make. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier, uh, and I want to just kind of tee this up now. And when we come forward, we'll give, uh, uh, P. Frank Williams, the director of this documentary, Freak Nick, The Wildest Party Never Told, a chance to sort of unpack all this. Uh, but there are issues of race, there are issues of class, there are issues of culture here. Um, and I want to give um, uh, Frank a chance to kind of walk us through those issues. You can't bring this many black people uh, anywhere, but certainly to a place like Atlanta. And I, I've said many times, and I've gotten in trouble for saying this, but it, it's true, and y'all know it's true. Um, I could never live in Atlanta. I love Atlanta. Got great friends there, but I could never live there. And let me just tell you why. Uh, aside from the fact that everybody I know is moving to Atlanta, <laughs> and to the point that Frank made earlier, you ain't got to be in freak Nick to be stuck in traffic in Atlanta now. Atlanta traffic is as bad or worse than L.A. traffic. So the, the fact that too many people are moving there is one issue. Uh, why would I leave from L.A. to go to a place that's just as crowded and traffic is just as bad? But the, the, the point is that Every time I go to Atlanta, and I've been there more times than I can count in my life, of course. I had two brothers and nephews that went to Morehouse, and I spent a lot of time there. It's a great city. But every time I go there, something happens at some point that reminds me that while I am in Atlanta, this black mecca, I'm still in the heart of the South. I'm still in a deep, red, redneck state. Something happens that reminds me of that, and I'm ready to get out of there. And that's why I can never live in Atlanta, because I get reminded somewhere in my visit of where I really am, and you go too far to the left or too far to the right, too far north, too so too far south, and anything could happen because you're still in the state of Georgia, the state of my father's birth. Um, I love it, but I get reminded of that, and I'm ready to get on the plane and get back to Los Angeles. Uh, that said, uh, we'll talk about uh, Freak Nick uh, and this documentary uh, called Freak Nick, The Wildest Party Never Told, uh, executive produced by Uncle Luke and directed by P. Frank Williams. We're talking about it right now on Tavis Smiley. This, this is the Tavis Smiley, Smiley Show. Paid for by government.com. Did you know the United States Mint has issued a new Morgan silver dollar coin in proof condition for the first time? Not only that, they are also minted in 99.9% .9 pure silver for the first time ever in history. Coin experts are calling this an amazing opportunity for anyone that knows the enduring popularity of Morgans. But you must hurry. Only 400,000 of these legal tender silver dollars were issued. These first ever Morgan silver dollars are brand new with stunning mirror like finish. Minted by the iconic San Francisco Mint. Call now and you're guaranteed a new first ever 99.9% .9 pure silver proof Morgan dollar. To learn more, call 1-800-973-9717. If you order now, you will receive a free coin collector bonus pack, a $25 value free with every order. Call 1-800-973-9717 now to secure your new Morgan silver dollars before they are gone. That's 1-800-973-9717. I'm Mike Moore. Here's the latest from the Black Information Network. The NFL Detroit Lions say Cam Sutton was working out at the facility when news broke that he was wanted in Florida for an alleged domestic violence incident. President Rod Wood said that he was on a conference call when the news broke and that members of the staff were able to meet with the African-American defensive back and recommend that he get a lawyer and turn himself in. The American Astronomical Society is warning people about fake viewing glasses ahead of April 8th's total solar eclipse. People will be flocking to the path of totality to view the rare total eclipse. To make sure the glasses are real, the society says wear them inside and make sure you can't see anything except very bright lights. Otherwise, using them to look at the sun could be dangerous. And that's the latest. I'm Mike Moore from your 24-7 news source, the Black Information Network and BINnews.com. Why settle for ordinary when you can have extraordinary hair? 
Visit your local SoCal FS Cut and Color Salon today and let their team of expert stylists pamper you with affordable luxury. Get a free shampoo with every cut. Book your appointment today at FantasticSams.com. This is the KBLA Sports Minute with Ray Richardson. The Lakers win two overtimes last night at Milwaukee without LeBron and still won. They beat Milwaukee by four to win their fourth straight. A monster game for Anthony Davis and Austin Reeves. AD had 34 points, 23 rebounds, and four block shots in 52 minutes. Reeves posted a triple-double with 29 points, 14 rebounds, and 10 assists. LeBron watched the entire game from the bench in street clothes. He's got a sore left ankle. The Lakers are 6-4 and four this season without LeBron. His status is uncertain for tonight's game in Memphis. The Clippers are back in action tonight in Philadelphia. Could be an interesting night for James Harden. It's his first time back in Philly since he forced the Sixers to trade him to the Clippers. The deal went down October 3rd. 31st. Philly fans are not expected to be nice to him. No debates, no speculation, just the info you need. That's your KBLA Sports Minute. I'm Ray Richardson. More news, opinions, and conversation when we come forward on KBLA Talk 1580. This is KBLA Talk 1580. Talk Radio. That's music to your ears. ears. We're unapologetically progressive. KBLA Talk 1580. Talk 1580. The possibility of lung cancer can be pretty scary, especially if you're one of approximately 8 million current or former smokers at high risk. That's why SaveByTheScan.org wants you to know that now there's a breakthrough low-dose CT scan that can detect lung cancer early, and it only takes 60 seconds. You stop smoking. Now start screening. For an easy quiz to see if you're eligible, visit SaveByTheScan.org. It could save your life. SaveByTheScan.org is brought to you by the American Lung Association's Lung Force Initiative and the Ad Council. Unleash your style in 2024 at FS Cut and Color. Get a fabulous cut and color duo from one of their expert stylists at unbeatable prices. Only at Fantastic Sam's, where hair care meets affordability. Visit FantasticSams.com to find one of their 60 SoCal salons near you. We've got a lot to talk about. Race, culture wars, political turf battles, criminal justice and injustice, the courts. These are the conversations you won't hear elsewhere. My guests are leading journalists, celebrities and sports figures, elected leaders and influencers. They aren't afraid to get into it and say the quiet part out loud. With Ariva Martin in real time, your commute just became the most engaging part of your day. Tune in weekdays from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. or find us on YouTube. Ariva Martin in real time. When you want it straight, no chaser. Unapologetically progressive. KBLA Talk 151880. We've got your black. black. There are many healthcare organizations serving our community. Not all are dedicated to community partnerships that educate, build trust, inspire hope, and improve outcomes. Providence has a robust community outreach program and has dedicated $50 million over the next five years to support organizations addressing health disparities in local communities of color. Examples of this commitment include the Biddy Mason Community Wellness Center on the first AME campus, providing medical screenings, mental health therapy, nutrition, and culturally sensitive holistic classes. The Black Mama's Glowing Peer Support Group that focuses on maternal mental health, birth planning, and social support. Providence is committed to building trusted partnerships with community organizations to better understand and dismantle structural, racial, and cultural barriers to better health. During Minority Health Month, Providence is sponsoring Health for a Better World. Informative conversations with Providence health professionals on Urban Family Focus every Saturday in April at 7 a.m. To find a Providence Health System facility near you, log on to Providence.org. Helping to make you the most knowledgeable person in your circle of friends. This is Tavis Smiley. My brother went to Morehouse in the 80s. So I have been hearing about Freak Nick as long as I've been hearing about Morehouse. And when he talked about Freak Nick, he talked about it like it was a fun thing to do. He didn't talk about it like it was wild or like it was crazy. He just said, yo, spring break, that's where you need to be. He said that spring break was when you had uh, girls were gonna be out there, great music was gonna be out there, and if you want the pledge, you better start knowing who those brothers were who were outside in these parks, because those are the same brothers that's gonna decide whether you made line or not. So for me, Freak Nick was like an entry point into the black cultural experience, into the black Greek letter experience. I, I think initially, when we first started it, 
I said I draw a card was the fact that this was a black picnic. You know, every, we all knew about Daytona Beach. We knew about some of the other things, but they were not put on by us or the people who, who you heard attend didn't look like us. So here we are in a, a historical black colleges and we're saying, we're gonna celebrate ourselves. We're gonna celebrate with ourselves. Now you're welcome to come, but we're designing this for us. The documentary is called Freak Nick, The Wildest Party Never Told. I'm Tavis Smiley. We are honored to be in dialogue with the director of this new documentary on Hulu. Uh, his name is P. Frank Williams. We know his work well. And uh, again, just delighted to have him in dialogue. We uh, had Uncle Luke, um, uh, Luther Campbell, on the program earlier. Uh, couldn't get that phone line thing straightened out wherever he is. But uh, the project is executive produced by Uncle Luke. And again, directed by P. Frank Williams, our guest uh, in this hour. It's on Hulu. Once again, it's called Freak Nick, The Wildest Party Never Told. Um, so, Frank, back to our conversation. First of all, um, I was listening to that clip. And, of course, I know Mark Lamont Hill's voice anywhere. Mark's a, a, a semi-regular guest uh, on this program. We talked earlier about Luke. We talked, you referenced earlier, Killer Mike. The lineup of people that you got to talk about, Freak Nick, in this documentary is pretty amazing, Frank. No, obviously, I want to try to cover all of the bases. I think there's like Little John and obviously Jermaine Dupree and Luke and people who were there in terms of the musical part of it. You know, and then we also had like city government officials like Catherine Bertrand or even Kasim Reed mm -hmm. who lived through that from a different political angle. You know, we also had one of the sexual assault victims. So, you know, if you know my work from Unsung sure. or American Gangster, or Who Killed Tupac, I try to give you all of it, which is the candy and the vegetables, because sometimes people only want the candy, which is the turn up, the girls, the party in the streets. But there's some vegetables which we needed to digest. The black political structure that happened in this, black sexuality, you know what I mean, sexual abuse. Sure. And so I've tried to get as many people who could talk about all those different things at one time and not just talk about the party. Yep. I'm glad you mentioned Unsung. Trust me, it's on my list. We're going to get to it. I, I think that's some of your best work, man. You've done a lot of great work. Uh, but that Unsung series, um, I I, I, I I love and I, I resonate with it on a number of different levels. We'll talk about that in a second. Let me now walk through some issues that you kind of cover uh, in this documentary and just have you sound off on them as you will. Uh, let me start with what you mentioned a moment ago, the music. Uh, what would you say about Freak Nick and the music? Well, I think that, you know, I keep telling people everywhere I go that this is a music documentary. It's about how the black music scene, which is So So Deaf, L.A. Reed, LaFace, uh, rowdy records, all of those six situations directly parallel the rise of Freaknik. And you can't tell the story of Freaknik without the story of the music. The music drove the people, the attitude, the dancing, the clothes, all of that, the music is a part of it. And when you talk to JD, the rise of his label, Jermaine Dupri, happened directly because of Freaknik. And, yeah. you know, I think that that's important. And that's how, I mean, I think that Atlanta is the black cultural capital creatively, culturally, and musically. And I think that this is how it started, and this is the beginning of it. That's music. Uh, next issue on my list, fashion. You can't talk about Freak Nick and watch this documentary without paying attention to uh, the fashion. Talk, about, uh, talk to me about Freak Nick and fashion. Well, well, no, I mean, I mean, come on. You know, as Rashida says in the piece, you know, for black people, we don't play about our hair. We don't play about our hair or clothes then. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have to have, you got to have drip. I mean, I know you with the with the Kappas, and I knew you were a smooth brother. So back in the 90s, I'm sure you had a nice high top fade. Maybe you might have had an escrow back then, a ball deep. You know, we was into the preps, the Jabos. You know, you can't, you got to go out and you've got to be fresh, uh, Tavis. And so for black people, you know, our clothes are almost a part of like our skin. And so the fashion and the clothes and the nails and the updos and the cars, you know, I put all of that in there for a reason because I wanted to show the full scope of it, that mm -hmm. it just wasn't the music, you know what I mean? It yeah. was the culture, the food, the, the fashion, all of those things. Yep. These other two issues I want to address now are separate and distinct, and yet they are inextricably linked together. And those are the issues of race and class. Tell me the ways, and we talked around the edges of this earlier, certainly on the race piece, uh, Frank, but tell me the, the way that race and class uh, come together uniquely and play themselves out in relationship to Freak Nick. Well, I mean, you know, you're you're one of the strongest advocates for African American unity and freedom, and you've been on the front lines of trying to secure that for us for a political nature for dozens of years and I mean decades. And so you understand that these white people did not want these young black kids out here having a good time. Mm -hmm. Let's just just say that mm -hmm. they wanted. To, you can do the same thing in Daytona, but when a bunch of black kids are out here having a good time, is not a good thing. And so we need to just put that fair and square 
out into the zeitgeist that there was a racial component to the situation that the black kids were treated unfairly, unfairly policed, unfairly targeted the way that they were treated mm-hmm. in the street. And so if that had been a bunch of white kids, that would have been a different situation. And, you know, one of the things which I didn't really put in the film, which is sort of like airing our dirty laundry, but it's the truth. There was a lot of upper middle class black people who were ashamed that these young black people were in the street. Mm-hmm. It's like your auntie saying you guys are out of control. So there was a classism within black America. I think that was a part of Freaknik. So not only we did have the police and sort of the political structure after us, we had some of our own people saying, what are y'all young black people embarrassing us for in the streets with this behavior? So those are some of the things I think play a part in the race and class issues about Freaknik. Yep. You mentioned earlier, Frank, <clears throat> that you talked to um, one of the rape victims um, um, during this whole Freaknik period, and we talked earlier about she it. Wasn't, I, mean, I want to be clear, she wasn't raped, but she was definitely sexually assaulted. Sexually assaulted, yeah. Let me, let me retract. You use the word rape, I use it. We both retract the word rape. Um, sexually assaulted, uh, which still ain't no fun, obviously. Uh, sexually assaulted. No, of course, um, I'm not diminishing anything. Yeah, no, I, I, clear, yeah. No, I, I get your point. I get your point. We're on the same page here. Uh, the, the point I was pressing toward is <clears throat> what she has to say, and if there were others who, in retrospect, felt like black women were objectified by Freak Nick? Well, I mean, 300 percent. I mean, I, I, would, I would be remiss as a black man in America to say that there was some abuse, a lot from our own brothers mm-hmm. who did some really inappropriate things. And we have to take accountability for that. But there's also thousands, probably 95 percent of the young brothers who didn't do anything. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And one thing I put in the film, which I think is important, and you guys, you know, I think sometimes because of what's happening with Sean and the whole of Me Too movement and Russell and all of that, there was a time when young ladies were choosing young men and there was a sexual liberation, which I talked about with TLC and sort of that was happening in the nineties for young black women. So there was young black women who were choosing the men. I think Mm -hmm. that a lot of times people thought it was just us going out to sort of hunt, but I think that I just want to make sure that there was a two way street. You know, you're 21 years old, you're on a college campus, you know, sex is on your mind. Mm -hmm. I think uncle Luke talked about that. So I try my best not to shy away from the tough issues. And that's why I confronted it all in the film, you know? Yep. Um, P. Frank Williams does some amazing work, uh, and uh, this will be um, on the short list of some of the best stuff he's done. It's called Freak Nick, The Wildest Party Never Told. It is now on Hulu. It's uh, directed by uh, Frank and produced, executive produced, uh, by Luther Campbell, Uncle Luke. Uh, when we come forward, a bit more about Freak Nick, and I want to got him on the phone today, uh, talk about some of his other work. I mentioned a moment ago, Unsung. I think that's an amazing, an amazing series. And when you see uh, the, the the flavor and, and the funk uh, that, that Frank has put on that on, on his work on that series, it's, it's pretty amazing to me. I want to talk about that as well. While I got him, you're listening to P. Frank Williams on Tavis Smile. Hope, agency, dignity. This is Tavis Smiley. Can you dig it? Come on! What is dedication? My biggest fear in the middle of my addiction was that my kids wouldn't have a father. And I started thinking, you know what? This isn't my story. I definitely had to become a better man to be a better father. It's important to me that my kids are empowered and truly believe that if if they can think it, they can do it. That's dedication. Visit fatherhood.gov to hear more. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Joey from Vermont, a farmer trying to get through the winter. Adriana from South Carolina, a single mother living paycheck to paycheck. Liam from Ohio, an injured father struggling to provide for his family. Hi, I'm Shinola Hampton, and I support the Feeding America network of food banks because they help provide over 6 billion meals to people in need each year. Learn more at feedingamerica.org. We must understand the politics of our community, and we must know what politics is supposed to produce. produce. This election year, KBLA Talk 1580 is the place for politics, unapologetically progressive politics, and we've got two of the best and brightest to help you cut through all the noise. Weekdays at 1 p.m., it's a more perfect union with Dr. Nick Quarterly Corte. And at 4 p.m., it's Ariva Martin in real time. He's the university professor and distinguished member of the White House Correspondents Association. She's a best selling author and Harvard trained civil rights lawyer. And they are both here every day to help guide you through all the sh- this year because you know it's going to get deep. Get your politics on weekday afternoons at 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. with a more perfect union. Hosted by Dr. Nick Quarterly Corte. 
and Ariva Martin in real time, only on KBLA Talk 1580. We've got your black. Black. This Easter, March 31st at 11.07 a.m., ECM will be at the Redondo Beach Performing Arts Center. We are inviting everyone to meet us there as we will be presenting the Black Resurrection Experience. What good is Jesus' resurrection if we are still living in cultural graves? ECM will present a stage play production that will address black dignity, black worth, black unity, black ownership, black vote, police brutality, generational wealth, mental health, black power through Jesus' power, and most of all, your purpose in life through the murder of Jesus Christ. And we will tell this entire story with singing, dancing, acting, rapping, with a little bit of preaching from yours truly, Pastor Shep. The Black Resurrection Experience. Easter morning at the Redondo Beach Performing Arts Center. It's totally free, so come get your free May Fresh Daily in the Mert Park, Los Angeles, California. You're listening to Tavis Smiley. Tavis Smiley and P. Frank Williams, who's the exec producer, who is the uh, director, rather, of this new Hulu documentary called Freak Nick, The Wildest Party Never Told, exec produced by Uncle Luke, Luther Campbell. Um, a few more minutes in this hour uh, to talk to Frank about his uh, amazing work. Frank, before I get to some of your other stuff, um, a couple of things I want to wrap up on the, on the Freak Nick documentary. Um, what would you say, we again talked around this, I want to ask you a direct question, though. What would you say all these years later, the cultural impact of Freak Nick was or is? Well, I think, again, you know, a lot of people talk about the partying and sort of the, you know, street festival that it was and sort of the music. But I think that this is, you know, Freak Nick is about black joy. It's about these young black kids finding a place where they can feel comfortable and happy and feel joyous, you know. And imagine today in L.A. and 200, 300,000 people were on the streets of the city, very little violence, somebody stepping on your shoes, you know, no sort of incidents like that. It mm-hmm. couldn't happen in today's world because of the danger and the violence. And also, I think everybody's trying to take a selfie or a video. These young black people were in the moment enjoying themselves. So I wish that hopefully this generation or whoever we are today can think about how beautiful of a thing that was, that this street festival took over the whole city of Atlanta and made this sort of utopia for young black freedom. And so I think that that's a part of the message that I want to people to take away from the film. Yep. Um, I love that phrase, Frank. Is there a utopia these days for young black freedom? I'm not sure. It might be fragmented. You know, in, in doing the film, I put in there 21 Savage did, you know, everybody's talking about why did I put 21 Savage in the film? But number mm-hmm. one, it was the marketing. But number two, he had an event, um, a Freaknik birthday party, where he basically had it in, a, in little five points, you know, an enclosed environment, police there, and got the energy of Freaknik with the dancing and Drake and Lotto and all these people there, that was a little moment of black joy and utopia. You know, we have one music fest. We have a few situations, I think, you know, Essence Fest, which kind of give it today. But um, I'm not sure if there's that many spaces like there were then back in the day for young black utopia. No, it's a powerful, powerful point. When we come forward, our remaining moments with uh, P. Frank Williams, I want to just expand out and talk about some of his other work. I I am always amazed and always um, impressed and, and frankly just humbled when I see black people in artistic and creative spaces dedicate their life and work to the telling of our narrative, the sharing of our story. And, and Frank has sort of dedicated himself to that in so many ways, on so many levels. But And, there, and there's obviously so much to explore. Uh, but when you find someone of his ilk who, again, spends their, their, their waking hours trying to find unique, interesting ways to share our stories... Uh, to advance our narrative, um, that's worthy of celebration. I want to celebrate Frank when we come forward, uh, not just with regard to this project, but his work on Unsung and other projects. He's worked on the Tupac project. He's also done some amazing work, and so we are uh, in conversation with Black Excellence, frankly, even in this moment. Uh, our many moments with the director of Freak Nick, the wildest party never told, now on Hulu, P. Frank Williams on Tavis Smiley. What's your quarrel with the world? You're listening to Tavis Smiley. Smiley. If you're like me, 60 and retired, making ends meet, especially here at the supermarket and drugstore is tough. I'm so blessed to have found BenefitsCheckup.org. It's a free and confidential website from the National Council on Aging that connected me to $1,200 a year in programs that help pay for food, medicine, utilities, and more. Maybe it can help you. BenefitsCheckup.org. 
my daughter was diagnosed with a rare malignant rhabdoid tumor on the spine. They sent us straight to St. Jude. My hope was gone. But when you get there, everyone's like, hey, we're not going to give up. And when you see other people not giving up on your child, that makes all the difference in the world. When I found out I didn't have to pay, I was just grateful. They saved my baby's life. Finding cures, saving children. Learn more at stjude.org. KBLA Talk 1580. We've got a lot to talk about. Talk about. KBLA Talk 1580, connecting you with services and solutions. Stay Housed LA has the resources you need to know your rights and the legal support to back them up. The COVID-19 pandemic has cost people their jobs and livelihoods. This has left an estimated one-third of households not being able to make rent and facing losing their homes. This is a fear no one in our community should have to face. You have rights, though, and Stay Housed LA is here to help. Stay Housed LA is a partnership between the County of Los Angeles, the City of Los Angeles, and local community and legal service providers. Together, they provide tenants with the information and support needed to exercise their rights so they can remain safely in their homes. Find out more about your rights by participating in a virtual tenant workshop. Get the legal assistance you need. Find additional resources in Los Angeles County and the City of Los Angeles. Stay connected to Stay Housed LA County for updates. This and more at stayhousedla.org. Stay connected to Stay Housed LA for updates. This and more at stayhousedla.org. That's stayhousedla.org. Or call their hotline at 213-694-0040. We've got your black with a community call to action from KBLA Talk 1580. Getting your biggest tax refund from Jackson Hewitt can lead to some spirited reactions. Jackson Hewitt, yeah! Jackson Hewitt is so sure they'll get you your biggest refund that if they don't, you get your money back plus a hundred bucks. Jackson Hewitt, yeah! Switch to Jackson Hewitt and we'll beat what you paid last year, even if you filed online. Hewitt, yeah! Ain't nothing to it. Switch to Jackson Hewitt and pay less for tax prep, guaranteed. Proof of prior year payment required when filing. New clients only at participating locations through April 7th. Terms at jacksonhewitt.com. Let's get back to more of this rich dialogue with Tavis Smiley. We've got four minutes left here, just four minutes left in conversation with P. Frank Williams, the uh, director of this new Hulu documentary called Freaknik, The Wildest Party Never Told. Speaking of uh, uh, black students at HBCUs in our third and final hour today, uh, we'll be joined in studio by two of the stars of Different World now on their uh, reunion tour to benefit HBCU. Stick around for Daryl Bell and Cree Summer coming up in our third and final hour today. Again, speaking of black students at HBCU campuses, we'll talk about that in just a few moments here uh, once we wrap with uh, P. Frank Williams. Frank, I, I've, I, I said the other day on this program that I believe that black media is more necessary and more relevant now than ever before because there's some stories that don't get told if we don't tell them. There's some issues that don't get raised if we don't raise them. Some people doing great work who never get profiled if we don't profile them. So the, the black medium is more relevant and more necessary now to my mind than ever before. And that's why I do what I do every single day. But I celebrate persons like you who are artistic geniuses in creative spaces who dedicate themselves, how might I put it, to, to, to elevating and amplifying the voices of black people and telling their stories. How and why? Uh, did you choose that lane? Why does that matter so much to you? Well, no, I've been very fortunate to be able to work in my path of journalism and all that since I graduated from Columbia and San Diego State. But I worked as a reporter at the L.A. Times. You know, Rodney King, O.J., oh, the yeah. Jack the Tupac, Snoop Dogg's murder trial, all those things. And rest in peace, Johnny was around, Johnny Cochran. And so you know, later on to the Source magazine when I became the editor, I grew up in Oakland as a son of Huey and Bobby. And, you know, Huey and Bobby were about liberation and trying to get the best for black people. So I'm sort of their grandson. Mm -hmm. You know, they used a shotgun to try to help. I used a video camera to tell truths and tell stories about black people. And so as a white, you know, as a black man working in white mainstream Hollywood, it's always super important for me to make sure that there's some of us on the front, you know, on the front line telling these stories, making sure they're done correctly and bringing it out to the world. So that's what God put on my, uh, my sort of my, my books when I got in this situation, and that's what I'm going to continue to do until the light is out, you know? Yeah. Say a final word, if you will, about Unsung. You mentioned it earlier, and I, I followed you uh, in, 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 in suggesting and saying to you publicly how much I appreciate the series. But when you, when you look at the impact that series has had, you think what? 
I just think that unsung is our behind the music. There's a lot of beautiful and amazing African American musicians who never get their stories told. Mm -hmm. And so shout out to TV One for bringing that that around. You know, it's almost 15 seasons later, 300 and something episodes, which is a tremendous victory mm -hmm. in television because we have such rich and amazing stories. Black people love to hear about their favorite artists, whether it be, you know, Houdini, Big Daddy Kane, Too Short, you know, Bone Thugs and Harmony, Sheila E, different episodes I've done. And so I really think that Unsung is like a cultural juggernaut that has really changed the way we thought about music. So and I'm fortunate that it was one of the launching pads for my career. So shout out to TV One and A. Smith for that great opportunity. His name is P. Frank Williams. He continues to do some pretty amazing work. Um, he directs this project. It's exec produced by Uncle Luke, Luther Campbell. Uh, the documentary is on Hulu right now. It's called Freak Nick, The Wildest Party Never Told. Um, you've done good, uh, Frank, as you always do. Um, great work, and uh, thanks for the conversation. I deeply appreciate you, sir. Thank you, sir. And shout out to Ms. Myla um, and all of the folks and Tanisha and everybody that we know, both mm -hmm. of us. And uh, keep your head up, my brother. Indeed, indeed. Same to you, man. I appreciate you, brother. All the best to you. When we come forward in the third and final hour of our program today, um, I just saw them walk in the building. There's a big glass window to the right in my studio, and I just saw uh, Daryl walk down the hallway and Cree walk down the hallway. So Daryl Bell is in the building. Uh, Cree Summer is in the building, and we will talk about uh, a different world. Uh, I didn't know these two conversations were going to jail this way, back to back in this way, talking about Freak Nick and talking about different world. But we are talking about black students. We are talking about HBCUs. And they are, are they've come together for a reunion, the entire cast. They are on a reunion tour that is uh, benefiting HBCUs. Uh, so what a great time to spend uh, uh, in dialogue with Daryl Bell and Cree Summer from different world. And we'll do that when we come forward on Tavis Smiley. KBLA 1580 Santa Monica. I'm Mike Moore. Here's the latest from the Black Information Network. The NFL Detroit Lions say Cam Sutton was working out at the facility when news broke that he was wanted in Florida for an alleged domestic violence incident. President Rod Wood said that he was on a conference call when the news broke and that members of the staff were able to meet with the African-American defensive back and recommend that he get a lawyer and turn himself in. The American Astronomical Society is warning people about fake viewing glasses ahead of April 8th's total solar eclipse. People will be flocking to the path of totality to view the rare total eclipse. To make sure the glasses are real, the society says wear them inside and make sure you can't see anything except very bright lights. Otherwise, using them to look at the sun could be dangerous. And that's the latest time, Mike Moore, from your 24-7 news source, the Black Information Network and BINnews.com. Why settle for ordinary when you can have extraordinary hair? Visit your local SoCal FS Cut and Color Salon today and let their team of expert stylists pamper you with affordable luxury. Get a free shampoo with every cut. Book your appointment today at fantasticsands.com. This is the KBLA Sports Minute with Ray Richardson. Ray Richardson. The Lakers win two overtimes last night at Milwaukee without LeBron and still won. They beat Milwaukee by four to win their fourth straight. A monster game for Anthony Davis and Austin Reeves. AD had 34 points, 23 rebounds, and four block shots in 52 minutes. Reeves posted a triple-double with 29 points, 14 rebounds, and 10 assists. LeBron watched the entire game from the bench in street clothes. He's got a sore left ankle. The Lakers are 6-4 this season without LeBron. His status is uncertain for tonight's game in Memphis. The Clippers are back in action tonight in Philadelphia. Could be an interesting night for James Harden. It's his first time back in Philly since he forced the Sixers to trade him to the Clippers. The deal went down October 3rd. 31st. Philly fans are not expected to be nice to him. No debates, no speculation, just the info you need. That's your KBLA Sports Minute. I'm Ray Richardson. More news, opinions, and conversation when we come forward on KBLA Talk 1580. All I need is one mic. One mic. Reparations Now has been a rallying cry in this country and around the world for decades. But the demand has taken on new urgency with growing momentum on the issue led by the state of California, which has completed an extensive study and put forth recommendations to enact reparations. California's reparations actions have huge nationwide implications. The California Task Force was the first of its kind in the nation, and the states of New York and Colorado recently voted to take on the issue. Dozens of cities from coast to coast, including San Francisco, Boston, Los Angeles, and Detroit, have started their own reparations commissions. One of the first known reparations